these at all because their blue light um, disrupts circadian rhythms. Instead, you can use amber, warm white or LED LED or, or yellow LEDs instead. Amber LEDs used to be all, I mean, amber lights used to be all over the place on highways. If you remember, just a few years ago, it seems like there was this pleasant sort of orange glow to the nighttime along roads, and they were very, you know, like I say, very pleasant, and your eyes recovered very quickly from them. These, I mean, there have been times with these new lights that I've been driving someplace and been worried and thought, maybe I should pull over, only to realize that, well, if I pull over, I'm just going to reach the same next one again. On the plus side, though, they, they do a very good job. They're very well shielded. I was biking home from a meeting at night the other, um, at, from the CCAC meeting uh, a few weeks ago, and the pockets of darkness were, were terrifying, but great. Um, so uh, here's some types of light fixtures. Uh, you can get a column-mounted fixture. Those are used for streets, car parking, cycle tracks, and pedestrian areas, or there's wall-mounted fixtures. Um, and you can see these are also shielded. I really like that pole one. It's a nice triangle. I like triangles. Um, and these are some uh, lower ones. Uh, these bollards here are the concrete ones that you see in parks. And you see all these artist concepts of how a new park is going to look. They often feature these. And then there's also recessed fittings, which are used for pathways. Sometimes they're buried in the ground for uplighting structures, trees, and other incidents. The problem is they're uplighting. And so there's a big, so if you do it right, that's great. But if you don't do it right, we're back to square one. Um, and so this is not the train station, but it looks like it, doesn't it? Um, just before we started talking tonight, uh, one of the members, and I'm not good with names, um, for, he a member of the planning committee came by and said that Metro North and the train station has finally decided and agreed with the, with, um, the, with the government to, to do something about this problem. Um, so that's great news. Um, and I, I don't know what this will entail, but I'm, I'm happy to be able to be the bearer of good news. Um, Oh, OK. Great. Thanks. Um, so this is not the train station, though. But you can see on the left, everything's lit up. And on the right, it's a little bit better. You know, um, Recessed lighting is done badly. Uh, sorry, here's, here's an example of recessed lighting that's done poorly at the top. That's a gas station. And I don't think it's the same gas station, but that's an example of how to do lighting correctly. Um, and here's an airport. And you can actually see how the light is moving in the right direction. It's not going upward. Um, and then here is this strange ATM. And I don't know why they would choose to light the undersides of trees, upper branches. But imagine if you were a bird nesting in those trees. This would be terrible for you, right? Um, uh, and here's a great photo, I think. Uh, on the left, you see light heading up toward the sky. And then on the right, you don't see any light. You can't even see where the top of the pole is. It just blends into the night. Um, and that is beautiful lighting design there. I just can't wait for them to replace the other lights. But I think that whoever designed this station here, bless you, um, did a wonderful job of, of controlling that. And there is, not, there is good news, too. All is not lost. Un um, unlike other environmental dangers, light pollution can be fixed surprisingly easy by shielding outdoor lighting and aiming toward the ground and turning off unnecessary lights. It will save money, too, but we all need to cooperate. And that brings us to one of the greatest things, sort of, um, in, that has come out of all this, and that's dark sky tourism. An enormous industry has sprung up um, that you might not know about, which is dark sky tourism. And while I admit that it seems kind of strange for people to travel great distances, um, to see dark skies, here we are. Um, and so places around the world are working to preserve dark skies and receive a dark sky designation from the International Dark Sky Association. As of May of this year, 100 places around the world have received this designation. I believe this is uh, Bryce Canyon National Park down at the bottom, one of my favorite places in the world, though it could also be Sedona, another great place. Um, Flagstaff, Arizona, which has a population of around 65,000 people. That's a bit more than the town of Cortland does. Um, it became the first international dark sky place in 2001. Um, there are a lot of astronomers there, so they have that extra political clout, I guess. Um, but that's a, that's a city that's about the same size as the town of Cortland, if they can do it. Tucson, Arizona, a couple hundred miles to the south of Flagstaff, has a population of about 500,000 people, about half of Westchester County. So there's more people living here in Westchester. Yeah, it's the, it's the music. Um, the Milky Way is visible from people's houses in the city limits. Within the city limits, people go outside. I've got a friend, my friend Ben Andrews, great guy. 
um, he lives in Tucson, and he said, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful to just be able to go outside and look up. Um, and that mountain down that bottom there, that's in Flagstaff. And I don't think that this photo has been edited too much. Um, so if those places can do it, can Croton too? I like to think we can. Um, what if Croton reimagined its lighting and became an international dark sky community? What if Croton cordoned off a place and set it aside to be an international dark sky sanctuary? There are a couple parks around that aren't doing anything. Um, they're basically empty space. Why can't we turn the lights down, invite people to come up? And uh, you know, everybody's seen Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. And they will eat and drink. <laughs> and they will spend money. So uh, this is kind of an ugly slide, but what this is, is it's a map from this great dark sky finder uh, thing that the International Dark Sky Association has on their website. And at the top, that uh, you can see where we live, more or less over here. And the nearest dark sky place is this one. This is called Cherry Springs. It's in the middle of Pennsylvania. You can also go up to Maine. And down here is the bottom. That is Groton on Hudson. And there is this circle that represents a 10 mile radius. And there's just nothing. Wouldn't it be great if there was an R like right there on the upper map? Wouldn't that be something? So what can we do tonight, uh, if not for the rain? It wasn't raining when I wrote this. Um, so here are three easy things we can all do. The simplest and most effective thing to do is to turn off unnecessary outdoor lights. You probably don't need to light up everything around us at all times. I, w I would bet that at least uh, that we can all think of at least one light that we probably don't need, even if it's just a front porch light that we have in our house. I like to turn mine off. My wife always turns it back on, or the kids do. I don't know who it is, but somebody always does. Um, we can reduce the light that leaves your house by using blinds and curtains and turning off lights when you leave the room. Indoor lighting contributes to outdoor light, pol light pollution. If you think back to that slide a, few, oh, a while back when I was pointing out and yelling at the, about this terrible light that's right outside my house, you could also see lights on inside my house. My bad. I'll fix that problem. And you can talk to your friends and your neighbors about the problem and maybe go a step further and talk to local officials about it too. I'm just a regular guy. I don't have any special degrees and I talk to my local officials about it and here we are. So if I can do it, you guys can too. Uh, what else can you do? You can protect the night sky um, by lighting only what you need. Uh, number two, using energy efficient bulbs and only as brightly as you need them. Shield things and point them directly downward. Um, use an automatic timer. Um, and choose warm light bulbs. Um, also amber and uh, soft white, too. And you can join the IDA. I plan to. Um, so here's some more resources. And like I said, I'm happy to provide the slides to anybody who wants them. Um, and you can join the IDA. You can look at Globe at Night. Uh, you can use, this is that dark sky finder right here, and then one of my favorites is this woman named Sarah who does uh, outreach as well. Her name, I mean, her, she's on Twitter as Saving Our Stars. Um, and if you, if you like, you can, there's my contact information there, and I also have business cards at both ends. I feel like a flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is supposed to be a photo of the night sky, but it isn't really working because of the projector. Um, so we need dark skies. We need dark skies, we need dark skies. I can't emphasize this enough. They are part of who we are, where we came from, and they are where we are going. They're our home, and without them, we're nowhere. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Croton, everybody, um, the CCAC, T-Town, the Croton Library, and thanks you. Uh, together we can do this. Let's, let's just develop a plan, and let's do this. <laughs>